brothers and sisters, after the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples. And the first thing he said to his disciples was, Peace be with you. On this Resurrection Sunday, I say to you, Peace be with you. Let us come before the Word of God in prayer. Almighty God, the great I am, the resurrection and the life. We praise you, O Lord Jesus, that you have conquered death. We praise you that you have triumphed over the grave. O Father, in the midst of all that we are going through right now, we need you. Come to us by your Spirit. Fill us with the Spirit of the risen Christ. When we are too anxious to be still, fill us with the Spirit of the risen Christ. When we are too afraid and lost, fill us with the Spirit of the risen Christ. Father, remember your feeble servant. Fill me with the spirit of the risen Christ so that I might be faithful to your word. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. This is the first Easter that we are celebrating physically apart from one another. I definitely miss the face-to-face interaction the joy of being together as a community. It is a loss. But that doesn't change the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is risen from the dead, whether we are gathered in the sanctuary or not. Christ is risen from the dead, whether we believe it or not. The Bible declares the resurrection of Jesus as a historical reality. There is now a tendency among Christians to sentimentalize the resurrection. They say that the resurrection is like the coming of the spring. Of course, the coming of the spring is wonderful, but the resurrection is not a cycle of nature. The Bible declares that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical event that happened once in history. The resurrection either happened in history or it didn't. If it didn't happen, then Christianity is nothing more than an imagination in our mind. And it cannot give us hope as we walk through the valley of shadow of death. But if it happened as the Bible testifies, then I would bet my entire life on it. The Bible declares that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical event that happened in real space and time. Now today we don't have time to delve into the historical details, but I would highly recommend Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. It examines the patterns of evidence in the Bible for the historical reliability of the resurrection accounts. If Christ is indeed raised from the dead, then it has an enormous implication for our life. If Christ is raised from the dead, then we will also be raised from the dead. And our resurrection is something that will happen to each one of us, whether we want it or not, and we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The resurrection is a miracle of creation. It's a creation of a new kind of body 
from a body that is dead, decomposing and turning into dust. It's not just the restoration of the old body. It's a creation of a radically new kind of body. And only the creator of the universe can create a new kind of body out of dust. When we ask whether the resurrection is possible or not, we are essentially asking whether there is a God who can create the universe out of nothing. Of course, the Bible declares, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible, or the book of Scripture, is the primary source for understanding God's being, His holy character, and His purpose for creating the universe. But there is another book that we often neglect, and it's the book of nature, as the church tradition calls it. It is subordinated to the Scripture, but we can know something about God by studying the book of nature. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So by studying what God has created, we learn something about God's eternal power and His divine nature. But one of the main problems in education today is that atheistic presuppositions are imposed on the study of science as well as on other fields. Last year, Dr. Stephen Meyer, a philosopher of science, was giving a lecture at a conference on intelligent design. And he and his colleagues noticed that one of the women at the conference was visibly moved and was weeping. So they were wondering what was so moving to her. After the conference, this woman wrote a letter to them. She had been a biology major in college, and during her college years, she had been told repeatedly that science has proven her faith wrong. But this conference was the first time she ever heard that science actually pointed to the Creator. So this is what she wrote in her letter. Throughout my college career, professors would constantly lecture that based on the evidence they had provided, there should be no way that anyone in the class could believe in God. They'd argue that science was proven and God was hence a myth. I was not equipped to present a valid opposition in a debate. I was desperate to find a co commonality between my beliefs and my education. Now, this is a very common experience in college. It's very important to understand that what the professors are claiming is not based on scientific evidence, but on their philosophical presuppositions. We are now living in an incredibly exciting time to study science. The advances in technology have dramatically increased our ability to observe the far limits of the universe from the largest scale down to the smallest scale. At the cosmic level, we are discovering that the kind of universe that can support life has to be so finely tuned that it is virtually impossible 
for such a universe to have risen by chance. At the molecular level, we are discovering that even the simplest life form called the cell is so incredibly complex that it makes the most complex thing that humans ever made look like a toy. So the advances in science and technology have only strengthened the case for the creator with an absolutely transcendent mind. The creator was infinite in knowledge and wisdom, infinite in power. Indeed, the book of nature, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Even the cell, the smallest living creature, declares the glory of God. So why is this important on Easter Sunday? If God can create the universe and all that is in it out of nothing, then he can certainly raise the dead to life. The resurrection is not only possible, but it's easy for God. So we need to understand that God is able, more than able, to raise us from the dead. But there is another question that is even more important for us to understand, and that is, why did God create the universe? More specifically, why did God create human beings? What is God's ultimate purpose? What is God's ultimate goal in creating human beings? If there is indeed a God who created us, then we cannot find our ultimate goal in life by looking into ourselves or by following our feelings or by just being me. We need to go to the Creator to find out what our ultimate goal is. So the question is, what is God's ultimate goal in creating human beings? As we explore this question, we will hopefully see how the resurrection fits into all this. Let me first introduce the word telos. It's the Greek word for goal or end. From telos, we get the word teleology, which is the study of purpose or goal. Telos is the ultimate goal toward which a process is being directed. In Revelation 21, verse 6, the Lord Jesus declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the telos. The Alpha and the Omega is the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. We see various combinations of the Alpha and Omega used in traditional symbols of Jesus Christ. The one on the right combines the Alpha and the Omega with the first two letters of the Greek word for Christ. The Lord Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the telos. He is from everlasting to everlasting. All creation, all the creatures have a moment when they began to exist. But the Lord Jesus has no such moment. He himself is the beginning and the telos. One of the theologians who developed the idea of God's telos in creating human beings is Jonathan Edwards. It's helpful that he distinguishes between the ultimate goal and the secondary goal. 
He gives an example. Remember that he lived in the, the 1700s, long before the time of local pharmacy. He says, suppose a man goes on a journey to obtain a medicine that he needs to restore his health. Now, it's necessary for him to obtain that medicine. But is that his ultimate goal? No. Getting the medicine is only a secondary goal. His ultimate goal, or telos, is to be healthy. We have another example, this time from the Bible. God rescues the Israelites from the slavery in Egypt and brings them to Mount Sinai. Now, what is God's telos? Is it setting them free from slavery? Is it liberating them from the oppression? Now, that's a very important question. If we don't get this, then we miss the whole point of Christianity. Freeing them from slavery is, of course, necessary. But it's only a secondary goal. God's ultimate goal, or telos, is to be united with his people, to live together with them so that they might be transformed into his likeness. So let us keep in mind the distinction between secondary goals and the ultimate goal, the telos. Again, the question is, what is God's telos in creating us? The idea is captured in the opening question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? The answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The answer is really simple, but profound. You might ask, why does God want humans to glorify him? Doesn't it sound egotistic? If I tell someone to glorify me, you will say that I am arrogant, even mentally ill, and you would be right to judge me as such. But God is not a creature. God is infinitely above all creatures. He is absolutely holy. He is the perfection of goodness. God is the perfection of love. Within God himself is the perfect love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Within God himself is the fullness of love. God is complete in himself. He has no need to be loved. He has nothing that he needs from outside him. And God is infinite in glory. Within God himself is the fullness of glory. He has no need to receive glory from any creatures. Receiving glory from us does not increase his glory. Then why does God want humans to glorify him? It's because God is the telos of all things. As our Lord Jesus says, I am the beginning and the telos. He himself is is the telos. God's telos in creating us is himself. And it is only right for his creatures to glorify him. God's telos in creating us is himself to draw us into himself, to share his glory, holiness, and love with us that we may enjoy him forever and ever. 
and to transform us into his likeness. That's why, as the Westminster Catechism says, the telos of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Indeed, the word forever is important. God created humans to live forever and ever. This is clear from the opening chapters of the Bible, as well as from the closing chapters of the Bible. As we read from Genesis 2, verse 9, that God placed the tree of life in the middle of the garden. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but whatever it is, the tree of life is meant to be God's eternal life flowing into humans. Genesis 3 verse 22 suggests that whoever eats from the tree of life will live forever. We humans are created to live forever with God. But as we know from the story of Genesis, we rebelled against God. We've asserted our independence from Him. We've decided to define what is right and wrong by our own standards. We've decided to be the master of our own soul. So now outside the Garden of Eden, alienated from God, cut off from the tree of life, we experience both spiritual and physical death. It doesn't take much to realize that there is something profoundly wrong with ourselves. At the personal level, we all know the pain of broken relationships caused by selfishness, hatred, resentment, contempt. And at the global level, even a little bit of study of history shows the horrible evil that we humans have committed against one another. Just in the 20th century alone, more than 100 million people were killed in wars. Even today, a countless number of people are being oppressed, persecuted, discriminated against. This is the reality of the human heart. Left to ourselves, we certainly are not the kind of creatures who can live forever. We are powerless to save ourselves. But the Apostle Paul declares in Romans 5, verse 6, At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. What we could not do on our own, Christ did for us by offering himself as the sacrifice for our sin so that by putting our trust in Him, we may receive forgiveness of sins. Now the question is, is forgiveness of sin God's telos for us? Again, remember the distinction between telos and secondary goals. We know that forgiveness is absolutely necessary. Through forgiveness, we escaped uh, the punishment of sin. But having received forgiveness, now what? Is forgiveness just an entrance ticket to heaven? Again, forgiveness is absolutely necessary but it's a secondary goal. God's tell us is to bring us to himself, to share his glory, his holiness and love with us forever and ever, and to transform us into his likeness, 
God's telos is himself. And in order to bring sinful human beings to himself, God himself came into the human history and began the long process of overcoming our evil with his sacrificial love. It's a process filled with conflicts, violence, and suffering because there is great resistance in the human heart and intense spiritual battles in the heavenly realms. So in the process, many terrible things happen, and we will not see full justice of God in this world. But through all this, God is gathering those who are humble enough to respond to his self-giving love and obey his commandments. God's tell us is to bring those, those of us who are humble into himself so that we might be united with him and enjoy him forever and ever. And God is going to accomplish that by raising us from the dead. On the day of the resurrection, we will discover that the glory of the resurrection far outweighs all the trouble we had to go through. As the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. As we mentioned earlier, the resurrection is not just a restoration of the old body. It's a creation of a radically new kind of body. It's important for us to understand that the resurrected body is both continuous and discontinuous with the old body. We know it's continuous because in the resurrected body of Jesus, he still had the nail marks on his hands and feet and the wounds on his side. Likewise, our resurrected body will be continuous with our old body. I believe that just as the face of the risen Christ was recognized by the disciples, our face will be recognizable by others. At the same time, the resurrected body will be discontinuous from the old body. We see in the resurrection accounts, the risen Christ suddenly appearing out of nowhere, appearing to go through a wall, and suddenly disappearing from sight. So our resurrected body will be like that. We will be raised imperishable. We will be raised in glory. We will be raised in power. We will be raised in a spiritual body, a body that is immune to decay, a body that cannot die again, a body that transcends physical limitations, a body that is engulfed in the glory of God, a body that is infused with the light of Christ. Our resurrected body will be glorious beyond the words, and we will be with the Lord forever. Again, God's tell us in creating us is himself to bring us into himself that we may be united with him and enjoy him forever and ever. The book of Revelation gives us a glimpse of the eternal life in the new heaven and earth. Of course, 
The human language is very limited. And, and it is an attempt to express the inexpressible. In the new heaven and earth, we will have the glorious resurrected body, and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. One of the prominent images in Revelation 21 and 22 is light. The most brilliant light that we know of is the sun. But the radiance of the sun will be pale compared to the radiance of God's glory. In fact, in the new heaven and earth, there will be no need for the sun because the Lord Jesus will be the light that fills the heavenly city with the splendor of his glory. And we will finally see God face to face. And he will make his face shine on us with perfect goodness, love, and beauty. And just by being in his glorious presence, we will be transformed into the likeness of Christ with ever-increasing glory. I believe that the glory of our everlasting life in the new heaven and earth will be ever-increasing glory, meaning the glory we will receive from God will not be static or constant. It will be ever-increasing. Again, I borrow from Jonathan Edwards. Our union with Christ is a union between the infinite God and a finite being, even in our imperishable body. Edwards compares this union to drawing a line that is ascending toward an infinite height. We can keep extending the line toward infinity, but we will never reach it. Likewise, in our union with Christ, our telos is Christ himself who is infinite. Even as we are drawn ever closer toward a perfect union with Christ, we will never reach the end. Our glory and joy will continue to grow forever and ever. We will be growing forever and ever because we will be growing toward Jesus Christ, who is infinitely glorious, infinitely holy, and infinitely good. One final point. God says in Revelation 22, verse 5, and they will re reign forever and ever. Now, who are they? They are those whose names are written in the book of life. Could it be you? Then you will reign with God forever and ever. The new heaven and earth will certainly not be a boring place. You will have plenty to do, reigning with God in his great universe. So on this Resurrection Sunday, remember God's tell us for you. Remember what you are made for. Remember who you are. Quoting from Dr. Dallas Willard, you are a never-ceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Let me say that again. You are a never-ceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. If you truly believe that, then it will radically change how you live today. It will radically change your priorities. 
It will radically change how you spend your time. Let me close with one of my favorite quotes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor and theologian during the Nazi era. Bonhoeffer wrote this in prison sometime before he was executed. There remains for us only the very narrow way, often extremely difficult to find, of living every day as if it were our last, and yet living in faith and responsibility as though there were to be a great future. Amen. Let us now sing our closing hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Let us sing it together.